<clears throat> well, good evening. I, uh, I think we'll get underway. Uh, I'm Mark Frankel. I am director of the uh, Scientific Responsibility Human Rights and Law Program here at AAAS. And I want to welcome all of you um, on behalf of AAAS and our partner, the Dana Foundation, to the first event in 2016 uh, under our series, Neuroscience and Society. Uh, tonight's topic, as I hope you already know, is the science and policy of marijuana, one that has aroused considerable interest nationwide and certainly no less so here in the District of Columbia. The series is a partnership between AAAS and the Dana Foundation, and I'm pleased to acknowledge their support for the series as well as their participation in the planning. And tonight we're very delighted to have uh, Dr. Barbara Risch from the Foundation and Executive Vice President in the audience to join us. Uh, before getting to tonight's session, I do want to indicate what's coming up. We do have a topic and a date for the next uh, event. It will be June, 14, uh, June 15th, excuse me, and the focus will be on enhancing, on enhancing brain cognition, especially as we grow older. Um, there will be two additional events in the fall, but those have not been scheduled yet, so I'm not at liberty to say anything more at this particular point in time, but we hope to see you uh, on uh, June 17th. Uh, June 15th. So I've got it the 14th, the 15th, and the 17th. It's the 15th. <laughs> uh, as some of you may be aware, there's certainly a, a growing amount of science uh, on the effects of marijuana on the brain. Uh, but I think it's also fair to say uh, that some of it has perhaps been misunderstood. And certainly a good deal of it doesn't seem to have been absorbed uh, by uh, the general population. I think there's a certain amount of uh, criticism, skepticism, unawareness, a lot of terms that you could probably come up with as well as to what the population, the general population, thinks about the, the effects of marijuana, uh, and uh, both short-term and long-term. And so our first speaker tonight is going to basically provide us with a rather, I think, solid foundation of what we know about uh, the effect of marijuana on the brain. I should say that all of the speakers have been asked to speak for about 20 minutes. Uh, there's only so much they can cover in 20 minutes. We realize that. But if they stick to their time, we'll have more opportunity for some dialogue among them and between them and all of you. Uh, so that's our, that's our, that's our hope. Uh, our second speaker is going to focus on some of the challenges that physicians face those who work with uh, patients for whom marijuana may have some medicinal uh, value, uh, but where the legal environment presents some very specific challenges. And finally, our third speaker will tell us about the DC experience and what it's been with regard to efforts to legalize the recreational use of marijuana in the district. We'll aim to end the program at about seven, and then we'll move outside for a reception to which all of you are invited. Uh, you have speaker bios in your programs, so I'm going to make my uh, introductions rather short and succinct so that we can get on more with the substance of what people have to say and why, you're he why you are here uh, tonight. Uh, I'm going to introduce each speaker in succession, and after they have all spoken, uh, they will come up to the stage, occupy those seats, we'll have a little conversation uh, among them, and then we'll uh, open it up for Q&A with all of you, and you'll notice there are microphones on the aisles, and this is being uh, recorded, so if you would use those mics uh, at that point in time, please do so. Um, a reminder about the recording, it is, uh, the event is being videoed, and it will be part of the Dana Foundation website uh, in due course as part, uh, as, as many of the preceding uh, events have been as well, so that they are archived for those uh, who can watch them at any point in time uh, and were not able to be with us today. So I want to get on with the program and introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Nora Volkow is director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse since 2003. She's a pioneer in investigating the toxic effects and addiction properties of abusable drugs, uh, one of which, of course, is marijuana, and that's the one that she's going to address this evening. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Volker.
Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, Mark uh, Frangel for inviting me, and I also want to thank Dr. Alan Leshner, who even though he's, now, he's not now at the AAS, was here before, and he was my predecessor at NIDA. So everything that I'm going to be telling you, he taught me with uh, some, 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 some new additions since then. Now, um, here it is. The, I have 20 minutes, actually, to cover what do we know about uh, cannabis in the brain and what it does and what it doesn't. And so I'm going to try to do that uh, within this time constraint. Cannabis is the most frequently abused uh, illicit substance in the world, and so is in the United States. And it is estimated that at least 117 million people in the United States have been exposed to cannabis once in their lifetime. And every single year, there's at least 2.6 million new users of cannabis. And this, of course, uh, gives you an idea of the impact of this drug in terms of uh, if it does have negative effects of what it can have. In the United States, we have seen very um, dramatic changes in the um, a policy that regards the legalization of marijuana, uh, either for its medicinal purposes or for its recreational value. And that has been associated with a strong campaign towards creating a normalization vis-a-vis um, -vis the acceptance of marijuana and the contention that marijuana is not, not a harmful drug, not only is it not a harmful drug, drug but that it has medicinal um, characteristics. As a result of that, and in parallel, uh, we have seen an increase in the use of marijuana among teenagers as well as adults, and this is a survey from Monitoring the Future, which we have been doing since 1979, and where we actually inquire 8, 10, and 12 graders uh, uh, about their patterns of drug use. And what you see there is for the two legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco, and then that comparing for cannabis. And this is for the indicator of past month use of these drugs. And for the past one, two, three, four, five years, we have seen that uh, smoking cannabis is more frequent than smoking cigarettes among teenagers. And this indicator is also true for the question of are you you smoke regularly, daily? where we're now seeing more consumers, consumers of marijuana smoke than of tobacco smoke. And, and, and so this, this crossing of the lines, and that had never happened before in, since the entry of the survey, reflects two phenomena. A very aggressive campaign towards the uh, prevention of tobacco smoke, smoke among teenagers. Actually, the rate of prevalence of smoking in, among teenagers have actually gone um, by, has decreased by 50% in less than 10 years. And in parallel, the steady increase in the use of cannabis by teenagers. Alcohol uh, consumption in teenagers also has been going down. The decreases are not as dramatic as tobacco, but it's actually a very good indication of prevention campaigns. Now, what is driving these changes? And as I mentioned, the changes in the policy around the United States. Now, people like to come up with simple concepts and say either you have states that are legalized marijuana medically, 23 states, and the, or that have legalized it for recreational purposes, four states and, the, and, 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 the, uh, and, and D.C. But if you look at it carefully and you look at the map across the United States, the way that marijuana has been legalized as it relates to its medicinal properties is very different from state to state. So you cannot just simply say, are there differences in, in the pattern of consumption of drugs and the adverse effects of marijuana on the basis of whether it is accepted as medicinal marijuana or not, because the laws are very, very different and have very different effects. Say, for example, New York. If you want to actually get a prescription for um, marijuana in order to treat one of the conditions that is approved for, you have to register and you actually have to go to a physician and you have to get the, um, the marijuana from a very specific site. You cannot just go into any dispensary and consume it. This is very different from what happens in Colorado and California, where as you're walking, and I did it in the Venice Beach, I was walking, and then I see this thing that says, prescription marijuana, $50. And I continue walking and says, prescription marijuana, $40. And so, so I didn't continue walking further, so I don't know how cheap you can get a prescription for marijuana. <laughs> And in, in Colorado, it, it has been described there, are more, and it's literally because I asked someone and I started to count it in my obsessive mind, there are literally more uh, dispensaries of marijuana than Starbucks coffee shops. 
and Starbucks coffee shops are actually quite popular in Colorado. But that just gets an idea of the difference between a policy that's much more restrictive and constrained, like New York, versus something like what's going on in Colorado and California. We are concerned. I mean, and my concern relates very much to the fact that uh, the legal drugs are the ones that are most problematic in our country and in the world in terms of mortality and morbidity. Tobacco and alcohol account for many more uh, deaths than any of the other drugs put together and multiplied by two. And the reason is not that tobacco is more dangerous than methamphetamine or heroin. It's not at all. The reason is that legal status make them much more widely available, normatively acceptable, and as a default, more people get exposed to them regularly, and just by pure statistics, more people are suffering in absolute number adverse consequences. So I always bring forward the argument that data is out there. Do we want a third legal drug? Now, of course, the scientific considerations are not necessarily the one that drives decisions, because in parallel, there is a very large market uh, for the, um, the, the commercialization of marijuana and marijuana products that has been estimated to grow from 5.7 billion, which is currently uh, in four years, to $24 billion. So that creates a lot of pressure in terms of economics as well as taxes that are going to be um, ga garnered by states from the selling of these products. But we need to see what happened with tobacco, right? Because you can make the argument in terms of economics, and then you look at it, how much does it cost the country to address all of the adverse consequences? The same thing with alcohol. And, and the, the net number is a very negative uh, economic uh, proposition to actually the legalization of these drugs. And we all have to pay for it. So, but, but again, hopefully we have learned from the tobacco, and we can do interventions that can prevent some of the adverse effects that happen with tobacco and alcohol. One of the things that we have been paying particular attention has been about how these legalization uh, laws are influencing the consumption of marijuana among teenagers. And we're giving the priority to teenagers because their brain is the most vulnerable to the effects of marijuana, both in terms of its potential for addictiveness, but also in terms of its potential for impairing cognition. And what you see here is the prevalence rates, again, within the constraints that I told you that it's not so simple to garner medical legal state versus those that are not. But with, even with those constraints, you can see that non-medical marijuana states, the prevalence average percentage of for the average pasmon used by 12 to 17 years old is significantly lower than those or the, or the states that have either recreational marijuana or medical marijuana. But I want to say just a caveat. Uh, uh, states that actually uh, legalize medical marijuana are states where already have very high rates of using marijuana before the laws pass. And that acceptance is actually what pushed the, the, the bill to pass forward. So it's not a simple interpretation, but we clearly uh, consistently observe much higher rates of abuse of marijuana in states that have legalized it, particularly in those that have uh, recreational marijuana. And we're also seeing higher adverse effects, such as those associated with fatal car accidents uh, resulting from marijuana consumption, as well as number of uh, kids dropping out of school because of marijuana consumption. Why do, what do we know about uh, cannabis, and why does it uh, have its effects in the brain? And we've done an enormous amount of advances in our understanding of how cannabis acts. And this is in part because there's been an enormous amount of interest among the scientific uh, community to understand what is the role of, a, of the endogenous cannabinoid system in our brain. Just like we produce endogenous opioids, and you've heard the encephalins that makes us, and the endorphins that makes us high, we also produce endogenous uh, cannabinoids that also make us feel good and that create a sense of well-being. And they're particularly, in, I mean, they're important in a wide variety of process in our brain and in our body. And so what cannabis is doing is just binding to the receptors that are there in our brain in order to be able for endogenous cannabinoid system to do its physiological functions. But when you take a drug, of course, you saturate those systems in, when, in ways that are not physiologically relevant. Um, just as with opioids, when you take heroin, you basically stimulate this system, and that triggers neuroadaptations in the brain as well as adaptations in other organs in the body that can result in adverse consequences, and in the case of the brain, can lead to addiction. 
In the cold literature of cannabis, which I, I basically is the term that people are using these days for marijuana, uh, there are two compounds, two active ingredients that have uh, generated the most interest, 9-delta-THC or tetrahydrocannabinoid, uh, because it, this is the active ingredient that is responsible for the rewarding and euphorigenic effects of cannabis. On the other hand, the other one that has generated a lot of interest is cannabidiol, referred to in the lay public as CBD. And this has generated interest because cannabidiol is the active ingredient that is responsible, presumably, for most of the therapeutic properties that have been described for cannabis. Not all of them, but many of them. So, but cannabidiol does not make you high. And in fact, there is data in the literature out there for animal studies and humans that cannabidiol, in a way, interferes with the euphorigenic effects of 9-THC. As a result of that, in the market of cannabis, what you can uh, predict has happened is the plants have increased significantly in the content of 9-THC, while at the same time, the content of cannabidiol has been going down significantly. So how, how much have these been changing and why are these important? Well, in 2000, the content of 9-THC was approximately 6%. Uh, between 4 and 6 percent. In 2015, the content of 9-TH uh, in cannabis can go between 12 and 13 percent up to 25, 30 percent. So you have a much more potent drug than what you have in the past. And in the 60s, when people were very high and sort of says groovy and, and this is great, nothing happens with marijuana, the content of 9-TH was 2 percent. And we do know that the higher the content the, the, of 9-TH, the greater the psychoactive effects of the drug. And this is probably the reason why um, we have seen a very dramatic increase in the numbers of emergency room admissions associated with cannabis consumption, as well as psychosis associated with cannabis consumption, because the content of 9-THC is much higher. And also that uh, increases the, uh, the risk for addiction, as this compound is more stronger. Um, the cannabinoid receptors, there are two flavors, cannabinoid CB1 receptors and cannabinoid CB2 receptors. In the brain, the main cannabinoid receptor is the CB1 receptor. And it is the, more, the, the receptor, which we call a G-protein coupled receptor, that has the highest concentration in the brain. Just to give you an idea of how important this receptor is. And it's all over the place, and, and certainly it is localized in the reward centers of the brain, and that's why it is rewarding, and that's why it is addictive. It's also localized in areas of the brain involved with pain, and that's why cannabinoids, uh, I mean, they, because they play and they modulate a very important role in the perception of pain. Extremely high concentrations in the amygdala, which is the area of the brain that allows us to actually um, memorize uh, condition responses, as well as in the hippocampus, which is classically the memory. But the amygdala is also important for emotions. And thus, the interest that it has generated, because one of the main the interesting roles, because I couldn't say main, because there are so many roles in the brain for cannabinoids, but an extremely important one in this, for us in the psychiatric world is that uh, cannabis basically modulates stress responses. So when you are exposed to a very strong acute stress, the endogenous cannabinoids kicks in to actually buffer the responses. And, and this is why, not surprising, uh, people are proposing the use of cannabis for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. The problem there is that when you consume cannabis, what happens is, I told you, it triggers neuroadaptations, and you immediately downgrade the formation of your own endogenous cannabinoid system, and that decreases in signaling. So even though you may be feeling better vis-a-vis -vis your stress and anxiety when you are intoxicated, when you are in withdrawal, you will be much worse off. And this is exemplified here. So these are um, brain images obtained with a PET ligand, which is actually a technology that allows us to look at the concentration of receptors of different neurotransmitters in the brain, uh, showing in the human brain the concentration of cannabinoid receptors. And you can see that they are all over the place, the hippocampus, and that's why one of the areas that uh, basically that's affected when people get intoxicated is they cannot learn, they cannot memorize, um, and uh, the classical amygdala. Well, these are different areas of the brain in people that are marijuana abusers versus controls. The marijuana abusers are in black and the controls are in green and in blue. 
And in blue are the areas of the brain where the concentration of the cannabinoid receptors has been significantly decreased in the marijuana abusers. And it is decreased because they are flooding the system. So the way that the brain adapts is by down-regulating the cannabinoid receptor. And you can see that it is predominantly throughout all of the cortical brain regions. And this could explain why um, when the persons are no longer intoxicated, they actually feel dysphoric, they don't have energy, they have tr trouble sleeping, very important, the endogenous cannabinoid uh, system, very important for sleep, and they have an, an increased sensitivity to stressors. So yes, you can use it to decrease anxiety temporarily, but it may leave you with a much higher vulnerability for more severe anxiety during withdrawal, as well as mood disorders. A big question that has emerged all along because the endogenous cannabinoid system, a very important role that they play is in brain development. And the role of endogenous cannabinoid system is that basically they guide the connections between the neurons in the brain. And the neurons, the brain is a network, it's a very complex network, and it basically functions by these networks of neurons communicating with one another in very complex patterns. And all of that formation is at its maximal stage during fetal develop up to age 21. And cannabinoids are the ones that are guiding where neurons should touch with one another. Very precisely orchestrated, very specific timelines. So if you start taking cannabis when you are a, a child or a, a teenager, you're going to disrupt this very elegant and precisely orchestrated process by which our brain develops. So this has generated a lot of concern about what are the effects, could there be untoward effects on cognition in, in uh, individuals that smoke marijuana during uh, adolescence or even childhood. And, and we know to start with that, um, first of all, whether you are a young person or an adult person, marijuana can produce addiction. And the risk of addiction are less than that of other drugs. So in that respect, it is correct. Marijuana, and there you have it, compared number of people that become addicted when they get exposed to a drug. So for tobacco, it's 32%. For cannabis, is 9%. So you can say, yes, it looks like nicotine is more uh, addictive than, than tobacco. But you have to consider that nicotine is legal. So your likelihood that you will get regularly exposed to it is, is greater. So it's going to be interesting to see how those numbers look when uh, cannabis becomes legalized. Also, it becomes 16% when you start uh, smoking marijuana as a teenager, and it becomes 50% when you smoke marijuana regularly. So you produce addiction. But it also, you, the use of uh, marijuana, particularly at age 17, again, if you are an adolescent, the effects are likely to be much worse. Your risk of addiction are more greater. But marijuana also consistently has been shown, if you start smoking before age 17, to increase the risk of not just becoming addicted to marijuana, but becoming mar addicted to a wide variety of other drugs, which has led to the concept that marijuana could be a gateway drug. And of course, there's research trying to understand if indeed um, the consumption of marijuana very early on primes the brain for the rewarding effects of other drugs. And there is evidence, certainly from uh, laboratory animal experiments, that that may be the case. What do we know in teenagers from epidemiological studies? And this is a studies that have been done independently and corroborated again and again the same findings. So I would say this is very factual. If you are smoking marijuana as a teenager, Trust me, your educational achievement is going to be significantly worse. And this is the, the study that was published in, in Lancet 2014. It's, I, I selected it because it's actually on a very large cohort. It's actually two cohorts, one of 2,500 and the other on, on 3,700 um, teenagers. And then they look at, at them and, and monitor for their high school completion. And you can see as a function of whether they use uh, less than once a month or they use daily. The completion is uh, basically almost, basically half between your decreasing your probability that you're going to complete high school. The same thing with degree attainment. But it's interesting also because this dosing is influencing, as we said, cannabis dependence, much greater when you are a daily smoker. It also increases, as I mentioned, the, the risk of becoming addicted to other drugs. But very interestingly, this particular study also showed this uh, six-fold increased risk for suicide attempt while it does not increase the risk for depression. And this has been noted by others, but it's actually not as solid and as a replicated finding as these, uh, these two that relate to degree attainment, high school completion, and cannabis dependence. Nonetheless, it's something that apparently may be related to impulsiveness associated with the consumption of marijuana that needs further investigation. 
This is a study that generated a lot of interest to 2012. Why did it generate interest? Because this one was evaluating the question, does uh, consumption of marijuana during adolescence actually impair your con cognitive capabilities? And they were uh, testing the uh, intelligence quotient, uh, the IQ. And, uh, but, and many others had shown it in the past, and again, the findings tend to show that people that smoke marijuana are cognitively at a disadvantage from people that have not smoked it during adolescence. But a big criticism of these toys has been that um, you did not control, they did not control for adolescent IQ functioning before taking marijuana. And it is um, a, a plausible explanation that those kids that were already at a disadvantage cognitively may have been at greater risk of using marijuana. We know that to be a case for other drugs. This particular study actually tested them from IQ at age 13 before they actually started to consume marijuana and then following, followed them until they were 38 years of age and tested them for their consumption of marijuana at different stages during their adulthood, and then tested them for their IQ. And what they showed this study was that uh, individuals in whom they, during this period of time when they were being tested for their consumption of marijuana, at one of those periods, uh, feed, uh, they, they actually uh, described that they were consuming marijuana, and actually before age 18, they show a significant decrease in IQ points. And the more the period of consumption, the greater the decreases in IQ points um, as compared to those that actually started to consume marijuana in adulthood. Again, highlighting in this case, there is not a question that the decreases in IQ points that you observe in these individuals were due to their premorbid function because this was controlled for premorbid function. So overall, it appears that those that uh, were consuming started to consume it before age 18, but then continued to consume throughout the, um, for longer periods of time, had in average seven lower IQ points. And considering that the average IQ in general is uh, around 100, that makes the significant difference in terms of giving you an edge advantage of actually putting you at a disadvantage. So it's not something to actually just dismiss. This is another very elegant study done by the group at New Zealand which has done some of the best studies in terms of neuroimaging, in which they were actually also looking at the effects of cannabis consumption during adolescence, and their measurement was the level of connectivity density in the brain, structural connectivity density obtained with diffusion tensor imaging MRI, and comparing those that have smoked during adolescence versus those that do not. And they identified, actually, that there were some very specific pathways. It was not that the whole brain had decreased connectivity, and I found that very interesting that it is regionally specific. But, and, and predominantly, they observe it in this pathway that connects with this region in the brain that we call the precunius, which is actually one of the main hubs of the brain. So I speak about the brain as a series of very complex networks. One of the networks that's most densely connected is the precunius, and that was significantly, the connectivity of that region is significantly decreased in, was significantly decreased in smokers of marijuana. Similarly, the connections into the hippocampus were another one that was profoundly decreased. And when I speak about how decreased was this connectivity, what this investigator reported was 80 to 85% lower density of fibers on in these individuals. And then you can start to observe that, yes, if you have decreased structural connectivity of an organ that is a network, then that could uh, perhaps be one of the mechanisms that's underlying that decreases in cognitive performance that are observed when individuals smoke marijuana, particularly at regular, at high doses during adolescence. And finally, I want to address the concept of uh, THC on mental illness, because that has also generated a lot of discussions, and in particular, the concept that the use of marijuana may result in schizophrenia, and all of you probably have heard this. Um, schizophrenia is a devastating disease. One percent of the population actually suffers from it. So what is it that we know? And again, uh, some, uh, I, I mean, I wish I could have very clear cut responses to you, but I don't, so I'll get you the evidence and I get you the perspective of where we are. Um, marijuana, uh, I show you, it decreases the cannabinoid receptors in the brain, it decreases connectivity if you take it as an adolescent. But also, if you take it as an adult, uh, you don't have to start taking it as an adolescent. What studies have shown consistently, 
and replicated by independent laboratories is that it decreases the volume of these limbic areas of the brain, which are the amygdala and the hippocampus. In a way, this is not surprising because these regions are one of the regions with the highest density of CB1 receptors and production of endocannabinoids in the human brain. So it results, it results in an atrophy. So I have two of these, uh, uh, two independent studies in which you are actually comparing the volumes of hippocampus and amygdala in cannabis in Greece and in controls, whether it's left or right, you see that's significant. This is a different study published uh, last year. And again, here are the controls. This is the cannabis users of hippocampus amygdala. Very, very consistent. So this is something that cannabis is doing. We don't understand exactly the mechanism by which is producing the atrophy, but evidently it has to be related to the fact that it is hyperstimulating this uh, cannabinoid system. In schizophrenia, though, another very consistent finding, similarly, interestingly, across a wide variety of studies replicated is that patients with schizophrenia also have decreased volumes in the hippocampus and the amygdala. And the decreases in the volumes of the hippocampus and the amygdala actually are associated directly with uh, psychotic symptoms. So the smaller the volumes of these areas of the brain, the greater the presence of psychotic symptoms. And this has to do in part with the fact that the hippocampus is one of the brain regions that actually regulates prefrontal cortical function, which is necessary for modulating many of the process that are disrupted in the full-blown psychosis. So um, you could see then in this context that if you are associating a disease that where you have an atrophy of limbic brain regions that are necessary for regulating prepotent um, responses of the cortex, regulating uh, striatal subcortical regions, then the use of marijuana is not going to help you. So this is, could be one of the mechanisms about why consumption of cannabis could exacerbate, and it has been well known, consumption of cannabis exacerbates psychosis in patients with schizophrenia, at least much worse outcomes. The question is, does it produce schizophrenia in and of itself? Multiple studies have been uh, reported trying to address this. And I said, the first one uh, that generated a lot of interest was a, um, a study that was done by Nancy Adriasen in 1987, which was done in a uh, on, on Swedish conscript, 45,000 of them, and in which she showed that indeed the, the diagnosis of schizophrenia was significantly higher in individuals that come, had consumed marijuana for a higher frequency than those that have not. And, um, and this, this was a very significant effect that showed that those actu a dose effect. So those that consume it very rarely did not really have much of a risk, but those that consume it frequently did. Following that study in 2002 came another, the same, the same study that I just reported, that is the Dunedin study that's following these individuals prospectively that shown the declining in IQ with uh, cannabis that reported that the risk for schizophrenia-like psychosis at age 26 was uh, significantly higher when individuals, it was 4.5, an odds ratio fourfold higher, uh, consumed the marijuana before age 15 than in those that consume it later on in whom the risk for, for schizophrenia-like psychosis was not any different from the general population. And then there were been more recent studies in, in 2012 uh, that is uh, consistent with another studies that are actually are documenting that the increased risk of schizophrenia is only present in individuals that have very specific genetic vulnerabilities for schizophrenia itself. And in the field of schizophrenia, several genes have been identified that if you have them, are uh, in associated with increased risk of schizophrenia. One of them is the AKT gene, and this is the the variant of that gene that is associated with a higher risk of schizophrenia. And so what they, they showed is that in this individual that has a variant associated with schizophrenia, only in those that have that gene, those uh, marijuana increase the risk of schizophrenia. And the effect is very large. It's actually greater than sixfold. It's one of the largest effects actually published in terms of a factor contributing so largely to the expression of schizophrenia. Other genes have also been shown to sim show similar characteristics, the catecholomethyltransferase, the dice binding gene. So it is the, no the sense that if you have the genetic vulnerability and you consume marijuana, then in those cases, marijuana may trigger an episode that otherwise may have never emerged. And finally, the most recent one in 2015, uh, this is a study done in Southern London that actually was evaluating the risk of uh, psychosis 
They don't clarify if it's chronic or acute, but the risk of psychosis was directly linked with the potency of the cannabis consumed being five, four higher than in the general populations in those that consume what is called skunk on a daily basis. And this is, the, this is a cannabis that has 90 THC content that is greater than 20%. So uh, if you summarize all of this data, what you can clearly see is that there is an association with psychosis, and I basically work with uh, THC myself, and you can produce an acute psychosis in an individual if you give them a high enough doses, but that's an acute psychosis. The question is chronic psychosis, and which is what we call schizophrenia, and within that context, it appears definitively that the regularity of use is important, that the age of initiation is important, that your genetic background is important, and of course, the potency of the marijuana that you are consuming. All of them are important factors that determine whether um, a chronic psychosis will emerge or not. The question is still out there. I, I wouldn't say marijuana by itself would produce schizophrenia, but it certainly is, um, can trigger and exacerbate psychosis. And we can also say that in some instances, that psychosis would have never happened had they not smoked marijuana. And this is the last message that I want to tell you with. This is again the Monitoring the Future survey that one started in 1975 in which we question our uh, query uh, teenagers about their use of marijuana, but we also query about their perspective regarding the risk of using drugs. And we have seen throughout all of this survey that as more kids perceive uh, marijuana as dangerous, a much lower prevalence of use in, in our country. And as less kids perceive marijuana as dangerous, we have the highest rest, uh, rates of use of marijuana indicating that um, perceptions of risk in adolescents do make a difference. And those interventions that are aimed towards actually doing what we did with tobacco campaign, uh, making kids aware about the adverse effects, could have a big impact. The problem is, of course, that uh, as I, I basically presented some of the studies, and I've selected ones that have very strong evidence, but in the field there have been many, many studies, and all of them can be, have, can be questioned because certain parameters were not controlled. And as a result of that, we are in a situation where we are vulnerable because when we say uh, cannabis is dangerous and people say, well, is it more dangerous for alcohol or tobacco? I mean, that's not a relevant question. It's dangerous in different ways. It's particularly probably dangerous for the developing human brain. So what we've decided as a priority for the Institute at the National Institute on Drug Abuse is actually to, to start, and we've started a study of 10,000 children as they transition from age eight and nine into age 21 to do periodic um, brain imaging studies to look at the brain structure, the connectivity, the function, cognitive evaluations, um, performance at school and to also evaluate the emergence of mental illness to be able to objectively assess the effects of cannabis consumption on human brain development. Of course, these kids are going to be consuming other drugs, so this would be the real world. Alcohol with cannabis, tobacco with cannabis. And in these kids, we will also be obtaining genetic information so that we can then have a much better understanding of sort of why is it that some kids can consume these drugs with no ill effects, whereas others are actually, this can be very, very detrimental. So if you ask me in 10 years, we will have many more answers. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Volko. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael Bostwick. He is professor of psychiatry in the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. He's certified in addiction psychiatry. And he's given considerable thought to how the policies governing marijuana have affected its potential medicinal applications. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Boswick to the stage. Thank you. It's uh, fairly daunting to present after Dr. Volkow, but I'll try to present a different perspective on a different part of the problem. I came to this topic about five years ago as the parent of an addicted teen, uh, and um, uh, he is now, t will be 23 with six years of sobriety, so there's a good, happy outcome, but it was a very painful time, and like many teenagers, he was insisting that, well, 
the recreational and the medical or if it's useful medically, then it must be okay re recreationally. So I'm going to try, have, I have several learning objectives for you. I want to appreciate how medical marijuana actually fails to fit the FDA drug approval paradigm and how promising research is thus stymied. Uh, you'll notice that in Dr. Volkow's talk, she was not talking about medicinal research per se. She was talking about the dangers of the substance. Uh, I think we also need to understand the challenges of doing legitimate research to support the supp supposed benefits of medical marijuana. See, uh, uh, pay attention to the catch-22 for physicians who are caught between defiant states that are legalizing the drug and federal government maintaining the drug is dangerous and without medical benefit. And finally, I'll give you another state that has put together a rather bizarre um, medical marijuana program in an attempt to kind of look like the FDA, even though it really doesn't. So there is a paradigm in the U.S. for doing legitimate pharmaceutical research, and it's been followed since 1938 through the Federal Drug Administration. And the new drug application tells the drug's whole story. There are multiple elements to it. You have to have the drug ingredients, how they were manufactured, the purported therapeutic mechanism of that drug, animal study results, and human trial results. I hope you're already thinking to yourself that we know none of this for marijuana, and certainly not for the raw plant, which contains many, many cannabinoids, dozens of different ones, plus many other substances as well, and even more that are created when you burn it. So the NDA, the, national, uh, the review by the FDA, the, this uh, new drug application, the question is the drug safe and effective for the proposed use? Do the benefits outweigh the risks? I like this one, uh, bureaucracy is a package insert appropriate. Um, are manufacturing safeguards adequate to maintain quality, assure purity, and preserve safety? Once again, with the cannabis that's being used in, in the states that have legalized it, plus elsewhere, none of these things are uh, really addressed, at least not to the standards of every other medication we use in our country. The proposed drug has to have an indication for which it's effective, and that can't be it works for anything I want it to work for. It has to have a specific patient group it will benefit, a known and characterized potential adverse effects, a specified delivery method, um, which can include everything by mouth, by, by vein, by, and muscles, a recommended dose range, and a manufacturing method specifying the form the drug will take and what it will be compounded with. Once again, you can see that none of this applies to medical marijuana as it is currently construed. The paradigm assumption assumes that the drug will be synthesized in a laboratory or a factory. It'll have a known exact chemical nature, lot to lot consistency, consistent and predictable potency, absence of contamination. And these conditions have to be met prior to doing the safety studies and the efficacy studies. As a gardener myself, not of marijuana in Minnesota, I can tell you that any plant in my garden varies dramatically year to year. It's a multi-step, multi-year, big money process. Now, this was quite the challenge to construct this slide as a, as a civilian, essentially. But preclinical testing can take years to synthesize the drug, to purify it, to test on animals. The IND application can take a couple of years to be filed, reviewed, and to get a response from the Federal Drug Administration. And then there are these stages that have to, you have to go through with phase one through, through three that work, look at various aspects of safety and efficacy. That can take another three years. And finally, the approval of the application can take two to three years. So we're talking about about a dozen years for the average drug with many hundreds of millions of dollars spent to get the drug from the lab to the pharmacy. Now, you need to keep that in mind, of course, as you think about the financial imperative for developing new drugs and whether that's possible with uh, this substance. How cannabis got to be Schedule One? Well, that's not a very pretty story. Uh, it was supplanted, it was part of the pharmacopoeia in the US in, in the 19th century. It has a five millennium history of being used medicinally. And it was supplanted in the early 1900s by opiates and aspirin in the US. Recreationally, it was used primarily by people of color, African Americans, and Mexican immigrants. Uh, there was a mid-century explosion of general population use, probably from college campuses and recreationally. But at the same time, there were all kinds of political machinations going on that led to reefer madness hysteria. Now, again, part of this was about the pleasure people were deriving, but certainly part of it may have had something to do with race relations in our country. The Controlled Substances Act was passed in 1970, and the Schedule I designees included heroin, cocaine, ecstasy, LSD, and marijuana. Now, this is a picture of uh, Mexicans being inspected on the U.S. border circa 1920. Some would have us doing this exactly the same way again now. There's a kind of xenophobia to that then, and there's a xenophobia to it now. Drug of the Devil, anybody know the film? This is Reefer Madness. 
And this is Harry Anslinger, Federal Bureau of Narcotics, quoting deeds of maniacal insanity were going to happen in this film, which if you watch it now is a camp cartoon, but it was taken very, very seriously in the 1930s and 40s by those who were worried about this very dangerous drug. Now, I would contend that marijuana was scheduled, or cannabis was scheduled in the absence of science. The arguments given now for legalizing it is that we ought to have science, but we didn't have science when we demonized it. My point about that is the THC as a compound was only discovered in 1964. The receptors were discovered in the 90s, and the endocannabinoid system has, has been described and elucidated uh, long after the drug was made um, Schedule One, and therefore uh, dangerous uh, and not uh, having any medical benefit at all. So clearly there is a problem in the beginning with the absence of science just as there's a problem now with the lack of science. I think there are two strikes against cannabis FDA approval from the very beginning. The first is that it's a Schedule One drug. Uh, high abuse potential, no accepted medical education, indications, and absent safety data. It's also problematic because it's a botanical. And essentially, as uh, DuPont uh, said, um, the, the, uh, the, it's a crude del drug delivery system delivering many other potentially active cannabinoids about which we know very little, and with contaminants made by burning. The exact chemical nature of, the, of what you're getting is not known. Dr. Volkow has alluded to the different percentages of, of the two ingredients that we're concerned about, mostly THC and CBD in any strain. Lot to lot consistency is not guaranteed, but potency predictable and consistent is not assured, and contaminants of all sorts may be present, including bacteria, fungus, heavy metals, pesticides, other drugs, sand, glass, beads, you, what have you. Only two botanicals has, have been actually approved as drugs since 2004, when the FDA did put out guidance for industry to try to make it easier to get botanicals through. One is made from green tea and is topical for genital warts. The other is a croton sap ac extract that's used for HIV, AIDS, diarrhea. From what I can tell, these two drugs have been approved uh, out of literally hundreds of applications. It's a tough road to hoe if you're doing it the right way, and if you're doing it this other way, it's even more difficult. Uh, there is Schedule I research uh, permitted by, under the Controlled Substances Act, but there's seven additional requirements, and what I want you to pay attention to here, frankly, is the alphabet soup involved, um, that have to approve this pre-new uh, investigational drug application. You have to contact the FDA for a pre-IND number. You have to query NIDA for what research strains are available. You have to ask the Drug Enforcement Administration for an application and a Schedule I license, request a letter of authorization from NIDA, submit the protocol to FDA and to the DEA, await FDA to review the IND, and then the FDA may go to the NIH for intramural applications or to Human Health and Human Services for extramural applications. Are you confused yet? Or, or overwhelmed, maybe is more to the point. And then after you've done all of that, you may be given some cannabis or the right to secure it from NIDA to um, actually do the research you propose to do. So this is in addition to the 12 years that is involved for any regular uh, appropriate, uh, appropriate is a, a, a term, very, very complex and very, very difficult to make this happen. NIDA can provide research-grade cannabis. The contract was renewed just this past year, but it contracts with the University of Mississippi. And again, there's a loose base, like in Minnesota, the approach is loosely based on the FDA paradigm. The farm in Mississippi is the one manufacturer. The, la the plot of land is, is secure. It's a single strain grown, harvested, and stored under standard conditions. And the project is processed into suitable research forms that qualified investigators who've gone through all those steps can then get to do the research to be able to uh, come up with a drug. Now, Marinol and Sesamet, which are both um, THC, one is THC, the other is a THC-like substance, both uh, are, got away with it, as it were, because they followed the FDA paradigm more than 30 years ago. They both are synthetics manufactured in laboratories. That was a requirement. They both are oral preparations. They both have clear indications. Um, and um, so they really met the paradigm in the way that we expect our drugs in this country to do so to be safe. There have been legislated exceptions to the uh, Schedule One status of marijuana. There was a compassionate program uh, that accepted enrollees until 1992. Um, I'm not clear exactly why it was stopped, probably for political reasons, uh, around the time of the AIDS crisis. At the peak, 30 patients were getting monthly marijuana from the University of Mississippi. I couldn't find an up-to-date, but at least four were still alive and getting their monthly supply in the form of, of uh, cigarettes in a can in 2014. 
What's relevant to physicians is that who cannot prescribe, because remember, physician licenses come from the state to practice, but they come from the federal government to prescribe, and you cannot prescribe unless you want to risk your federal license to prescribe. But physicians, through a series of court cases, were granted the right through free speech rights to recommend medical marijuana to their patients, even they couldn't prescribe it. Very interesting. I know of no other situation in medicine where my right to speak about something is, is given to me by free speech rights rather than by my license as a physician, but that's where it stands. Also a fun fact, I don't know what it means exactly, but the federal government actually holds a patent for potential eventual use of something related to marijuana as um, a, an antioxidant neuroprotectant. The states, in my opinion, have gone rogue. They're crazy. 23 of them, District of Columbia, they defied federal law, they've legalized medical marijuana, but in a very a willy-nilly kind of way. It's an attack on federalism, and it's, but it is also a response to federal inaction and public pressure. There's no consistency state to state in indications for medical marijuana, just like there's no consistency in the product. There's no consistency for mechanisms for certifying need, regulations for dispensation. The origin varies dramatically. It doesn't, not the same at all. Dispensaries vary from state to state, how much an individual can have, who can grow it, who, they, who can give it to them. All of that varies. So it's really just a hodgepodge. And what's true in one state may not be true in the next state at all. So do the states have the right to legalize, re regulate, medicate, and educate? I would argue no, not in the way that we have currently constructed our process for, uh, for approving drugs. But uh, the states do, as we see in many other examples, uh, including uh, gay marriage recently, push the federal government to move where maybe it didn't want to go. It's a patchwork. It's medical and legal chaos. On the left, you see all these different, every color in each of these two maps represents either a different way in which the drug is available depending on the state or a different way in which the law is written depending on the state. Some states have decriminalized, which doesn't mean that, that you get away scot-free. Other states have made it completely okay recreationally. Other states have said no to all of it. And some states have come up with their own version of what uh, is a medical marijuana law that is like no other state's version. There's a shaky detente with, uh, with the federal government, and the discretion is really advised. As Congress continues to contend, because Congress again approved the CSA, not scientists, that uh, marijuana is dangerous and illegal. That has not changed since the 1960s. The Department of Justice, however, is making an argument in letting the states get away with a lot of this that they don't have the resources to uh, go after things that uh, they don't deem are important enough, investigative and prosecutorial resources. Federal pr prosecutors scattered throughout the country have broad enforcement discretion, but the DOI makes very clear, Department of Justice, that it's not endorsing state laws that contradict federal law. It's just telling the, the local prosecutors to use discretion in terms of how they uh, expend their resources. The Ogden memo in uh, October of 2009, uh, again, pointed out what they were really concerned about were traffickers of illegal drugs, including marijuana, and their, the goal of Department of Justice was to disrupt illegal drug manufacturing and trafficking networks. There is a guidance to not go after individuals and care caregivers whose actions are in clear and unambiguous compliance with applicable state law. It's kind of funny that the law is not really legal, but it's legal enough, sort of. Two years later, the Cole Memo uh, clarified this point and said that the issue was large-scale cultivators, sellers, and distributors who were violating the Controlled Substance Act and risking potential prosecution. And state laws and local ordinances were not, in fact, protective of these large growers. So there was a problem, but you could legalize it, but where could you get it? Because the, there was no legal way to get it. L another Cole Memo, the, this is from Assistant uh, uh, um, Attorney General, do I have that right? Department of Justice person. Um, size of operations is not uh, a proxy for illegal trafficking. So if a state had um, large-scale sellers who are in compliance with a strong state regulatory system, then that would be better than having people who are just in it to make money. Um, state laws address public health and safety and law enforcement interests, and the, and the federal government would be less interested if they were, the states were concerned about not distributing to minors, not, uh, preventing criminal activity, making sure diversion to non-legal states did not happen, violence, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, just this past week, the Supreme Court refused to hear a, a challenge from Nebraska and Oklahoma to the Colorado law. Nebraska and Oklahoma were claiming that the crime rates in their states were up because of diversion, essentially, across the border, but the Supreme Court would not uh, weigh in on that. So prescribers are wary. 
No, I'm not prescribing medical marijuana. I simply said the next time your stomach's upset, try some grass. <laughs> also, risks remain. The bad news is your illness has no cure. The good news is we can manage your pain with medical marijuana, but the really bad news is I'll be arrested if I prescribe pot, so take two aspirins and see me next month. Obviously, this is not a very good answer, and particularly if you want to know what your patient is up to. Minnesota, just I'm going to end with a bit about that and the conclusions. One state among many has its own cannabis program overview, and it's, um, uh, it, the goals were to limit at, uh, federal liability for medical doctors, so they don't recommend, they don't prescribe, to gather observational research data, so they have a patient registry, doesn't mean it's a very good one, but it's there, to standardize the product through having limited authorized manufacturer and distribution sites, so the state got into the business of making the product and distributing it, and finally to prohibit any kind of smoking so that the recreational and criminal element would not be involved. Uh, it's a quasi-legitimate sort of law. I call it the law of onlys. The, the doctor's only role is to verify qualifying conditions, of which there are about nine. Um, the latest one, which has not been accepted to date, is chronic pain, very, very uh, generally described. Only certain medical conditions qualify. The drug is available only as an oil, a pill, or a liquid. Only a full plant extract, not the leaves or the flowers. No smoking, smoking not allowed. Vaping is allowed, but only with a liquid extract from the state. And finally, only approved pharmacists at eight sites can distribute the product from only two Minnesota factories. Now, one of the interesting things here is the pharmacists essentially become the prescribers. Last time I checked, pharmacists were not authorized to prescribe, but in the state of Minnesota, they're the ones doing that job because the doctors cannot. So conclusions. New drugs in the U.S. are routinely approved by an elaborate time-consuming FDA paradigm. That's how we do it. That's how we can trust our medications. Cannabis has two strikes against it. Number one, it's a botanical. And number two, it's on schedule one with high abuse potential, no medical value, and therefore very difficult for researchers to get without going through a very complex process. Botanicals themselves don't fit the FDA paradigm. That makes new drug development more challenging to initiate. Schedule one research requires DEA, NIDA, FDA, pre ind approval, and it makes a cumbersome process even more so. States, as a result of all this, have gone rogue in the absence of federal leadership, and they've legalized medical marijuana without state to, to state regulatory consistency in the absence, really, of, of much good science. Um, and finally, it appears there's no end in sight to this federal state standoff. And I think the ultimate result of this is that a protein source of potential pharmaceuticals is moribund. Again, the point being that over the past, uh, since 1970, we've really come to understand this endocannabinoid system that Dr. Volkow has so elegantly described and how potentially important it could be like any other neurotransmitter system for coming up with medications that might be able to be used if we could actually do the research. So um, there's a bibliography, and that's what I have to tell you. Thanks. Well, we've got a lot on the table to discuss. Um, but let me introduce our final and third speaker. Um, David Grasso is a member of the Council of the District of Columbia. He's an elected at, a, at a, uh, an at-large member, if you will, to represent all the DC citizens. His primary focus on the council has been education from early childhood to adult learning, but he's been very involved in the district's earlier efforts to legalize marijuana for recreational use and is going to talk to us a little bit about that experience. So please join me in welcoming uh, David Grasso. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, those are tough acts to follow, so I appreciate your patience with me. I'm going to talk from a completely different perspective, and I don't have a slideshow. I uh, don't know what to do with those, so I decided I would just tell you a little bit about my story. Um, I got elected, as was said, back in 2012, and I got into the council in early 2013, and we'd already had a significant amount of discussion around uh, medical marijuana in the District of Columbia. Um, I know that the, uh, the science wasn't entirely there, but the people were ready to have the conversation. They had already passed a referendum in D.C. to talk about medical marijuana, but to also actually move medical marijuana forward to be able to be purchased. Um, that was overwhelmingly supported through a referendum process, which we have in the district, that allows you to actually do um, legislative work through the people directly. So 
um, we were kind of in a pickle in the council where it was how do you implement the people's will, which was directly asked upon us at the same time uh, monitoring what was the right thing to do. Um, I'll note that uh, I'm not a doctor, I'm actually a lawyer um, and a politician. So this whole perspective will be from the political side of it, the policy side of it, and I think that's important to note. Um, I don't pretend to know the science of this, but I think uh, the reality is, is that not anyone really knows the science of this. Um, and I think we'd be foolish to sit here and say that I have all sorts of great arguments for legalizing marijuana because it's good for you or uh, because it's the right thing to do for your health or any of those regards. Um, but I will note that as we move forward with medical marijuana, we did it with a lot of caution in the District of Columbia. And partly because, um, maybe you all don't know this, but the District of Columbia is um, treated as a second-class jurisdiction by Congress. Uh, we are subjected to Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, which says that any law that's passed in D.C. has to go for congressional approval. And so when the referendum passed, uh, Congress put a stop on that referendum and said, regardless of the will of the people in the district, we're going to actually say, literally, you're not allowed to expend any money to implement medical marijuana in D.C. Um, thank goodness Jose, Serran uh, Jose, uh, Jose Serrano was, um, the congressman from New York was the overseer of our committee uh, in the mid-2000s and took that rider off. And so then we moved forward with great caution because we knew that if we moved forward too quickly, Congress would just step in and, and uh, completely undo all of our efforts. So interestingly, since that was removed, um, there's been no act by Congress on medical marijuana in the District of Columbia. And our program has grown and grown over the years. It's uh, slowly, we had lots of conditions, qualifying conditions that we set up. Uh, we've moved to a new paradigm now where there are no qualifying conditions. Um, at one point, we only had 200 and some people that were uh, signed up. We did it through um, recommendations. As you noted, there couldn't be a prescription. Um, we are tightly regulated in the number of dispensaries, the number of cultivators, um, all the things that you can imagine you have to do to try to regulate it properly. So as I was saying, I was elected in 2012. 2013, I came into office and I began to explore what it meant to be an at-large council member in D.C. and what my responsibility was. And in, in the summer of 2013, I read uh, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Uh, there was also two reports that came out uh, in the District of Columbia studying the effect of the illegality of marijuana, the prohibition of marijuana in the District of Columbia on arrests. And many, maybe many of you know about this report, but it came out that 91 percent of everyone who was arrested in the District of Columbia for marijuana was an African American. Now that is not the case when it comes to who actually uses marijuana in the District of Columbia for recreational purposes illegally. We know from studies that it's more 50-50 white and black. So, uh, you know, I'm looking at this, I'm reading the New Jim Crow, and I'm saying to myself as a leader in the city, what do I have to do uh, to try to stop sending people to jail uh, in the way that we've been doing it? And so, uh, again, I have to admit, I don't know all the science when it comes to the effects on you, and I certainly don't encourage people to smoke or use marijuana, I never have. Um, but what I do know is that when we send people to jail and we do it in the disproportionate way that we've been doing it, um, we were hurting more people than we were helping. So um, in September of 2013, I introduced a package of three criminal justice bills. One of them was the tax and regulation of marijuana. Uh, another one was to uh, forgive or seal the records of anybody who had been arrested for a nonviolent marijuana offense previously. Uh, to try to help them be able to move forward with their lives appropriately. That bill is now in effect and, and has become law last year. Um, the tax and regulate bill is another whole uh, game, and I can tell you it's been an uh, uphill battle the whole way. Uh, when I introduced the bill, um, I made a very profound speech, I believe, on the disparity enforcement on how the war on drugs hasn't worked. But I also made an impassioned plea for regulation. Um, I knew that Initiative 71 was coming. Um, and I knew that in the District of Columbia, we would not be better off if we waited to see what happened in the free market when it came to legal marijuana. So my bill was pretty specific. It applied uh, the same rules that we apply to alcohol. It applied the same rules we apply to smoking in public. Um, and then it also allowed for great uh, uh, in-depth work on regulations to implement it. 
Um, that bill, uh, when I introduced it, had uh, zero co-sponsors and zero co-introducers. It was just me. Um, a year and a half later, in January of 2015, I reintroduced the bill in our new council period, and everyone joined me, including the mayor. So what happened in that intervening time period, I think, is very relevant to this conversation, because I don't think anyone was looking closely at the science of this. I think what they were looking at was not just the public policy effect of what people wanted, uh, the Initiative 71 um, passed by 71% in the District of Columbia, wanting to have uh, recreational marijuana. But I think what also happened, and I think this is probably the most compelling part, <clears throat> the people of the District of Columbia began to realize that sending people to jail was doing harm. And that if you had a nonviolent offender going to jail, when they came back to the District of Columbia after being in the federal prison system, because here you don't just go to the local jail, you go to federal prison around the country, we are subjected to the Bureau of Prisons policies, you end up coming back way worse off than you went in. And you know the science shows us there um, that harm is being done not just to that individual who we're sending to jail, but also to the community when that person returns back from their time in prison. And so for us, it was a question not of, of the, the science of marijuana, and I think we can talk about that for a long time, but the science of the criminalization of something like this that is putting people there who are not violent actors um, and the effect of our, on our community, and especially the, the racial dynamic, the effect on, on the African American community, on the poorer community in the District of Columbia was unfair and unjust. And so you can imagine then after a year of debate that there was very little debate to have when it came to what the laws we were gonna pass were. Um, there was, I think, a need to think about it more, and I think we're still thinking about it. As you probably know, uh, Congress did step in when it came to recreational marijuana use in the District of Columbia. Although they didn't stop Initiative 71, they did stop my bill to tax and regulate marijuana. And it's an interesting, I'll just digress for a second, it's an interesting question for how many years, um, close on 80 years or so, there's been uh, zero tolerance prohibition on marijuana in this country, more or less. Um, and you can say that there hasn't been the studies that need to be done on it. You can say that there hasn't been the analysis that needs to be done on it, partly because of that. Um, and, and I guess what I'm saying is when you tax and regulate, that gives you, I think, a better opportunity to do that, a better opportunity to monitor it, a better opportunity to actually control it. So when you thought that prohibition was controlling it, you should just grow up where I grew up, you know, in Petworth, in the District of Columbia off Georgia Avenue. It was not controlled. Um, and I think uh, there was a, a point made earlier that a hundred and some million people or more in this country have smoked marijuana. Well, prohibition and the war on drugs didn't work because, uh, you know, people did try it and then people weren't worried about the science and um, maybe to their detriment too. And I think that's not fair. Now, if you pick up a pack of cigarettes or you read a website on the effects of smoking, you know the impact it's going to have and it's pretty serious impact. So the wild, wild west doesn't work. Um, and in my opinion, it's better to have a regulatory framework in place so that we can do what's re what the responsible thing to do is as a government, which is to make sure that we regulate when necessary, to keep it out of the hands of minors, which is appropriate. Uh, my bill would only allow it to be for people who are 21 and older. But regulation also lets adults make decisions about their lives, which I think is a very important aspect of this, that with, when you're given the accurate information and you're given what, you're, what you need to know about something, you have the right as an adult to make a decision about that. Um, and I think that's very important for us to remember as we move forward with this change in policy in this country, um, and, and certainly in, in marijuana or maybe even other drugs as we move forward. So I'm not, I'm not here to, to you know, argue that it's, it's, it's healthy for you to smoke pot. In fact, I don't think it is. And um, I can tell you, um, I think that it is your choice if you're 21 and older whether or not you want to take that risk. But I think that if we had the regulation in place, if we had the laws in place like I want to put in place in the District of Columbia, you would be able to do the education campaigns properly. You would be able to study it properly. You would be able to understand it properly. And then you'd be able to prevent people from doing it who maybe don't want to do it and prevent minors from doing it because it could and probably does have an effect on their development. I'll just note uh, quickly on the medical marijuana side. 
<clears throat> it's now grown in the district to a pretty big, big program. Um, it's not enormous, but uh, there's over 3,500 people now that have recommendations or prescriptions or whatever you want to call them uh, for medical marijuana. Uh, we still have significant limits on it. I'm not sure if those will be lifted. Uh, it's now a decision between you and your doctor, uh, not a short list of qualifying conditions. It's also um, a very few distribution or you know uh, distribution centers or uh, cultivation centers in the district, so it's a limit on the number of plants that can be grown. There's also lots of testing being done on the marijuana. Um, there's regulation by the Department of Health that requires monthly testing, and I think the Department of Health needs to be given some credit here. Um, they're not uh, just floundering about. They are trying to understand what the impact is, and they're trying to regulate that. I think the industry is, too. I've been to the cultivation centers. I've seen the the equipment that they have to try to understand better the effects of every different compound within marijuana um, and the value added to their industry if they can actually determine that and say this is going to actually help you for this or this or not help you for something else. And so in the prohibition world where there was no access to marijuana except for it sounds like in the farm in Mississippi, um, I guess there, there was no way to really know. And so I'm hoping that as we move forward, we'll do it in a responsible way, uh, that we will continue to uh, study this in a strong and open way and, and, and try to figure out what's best for our country and for our city. Um, but I think one more note is important, and then I'll, I'll sit down and we can ask questions. The federal government is a government of inaction. I mean, this is not the only thing I'm working on where I wish the federal government would do something. Um, I'm also working on a bill that would give uh, family leave, paid family leave for people in, in the District of Columbia so that people could be with their loved ones and take care of their elderly parents or their newborn child and not be at risk of losing their job. The federal government, I think, has an obligation to start to lead the way on some of these things. Um, Congress is, is sitting on their hands uh, not doing things other than impeding on the District of Columbia's right to actually govern our own city. And so, you know, I, I've called on the Congress, I've called on the President to step up in these areas and not allow it to continue to be the Wild West that it is when it comes to drugs, not allow the, the world to continue to hide uh, from the real issues that matter, which is how to regulate pro properly this, this, this world, um, whether it's any drug, heroin, <coughs> cocaine, marijuana, you don't know what it's, what's in it, you don't know what um, is ultimately going to happen if you if you regulate it, and I think that we need to take that brave step and and try to start regulating things rather than just outright prohibition on these things. Um, and I'm looking forward to continuing to work on that throughout my my entire time in in the council, and believe it's an obligation that I have uh, to try to stop sending so many people to jail, uh, and and realize that that's what's best for the District of Columbia. So thank you very much. Ask the uh, speakers to put, uh, or at least turn on their, uh, their lavalier mics if they don't want to wear them. Uh, this is such a complicated topic. I have decided that what I'm going to do is I'm going to give each of the speakers two minutes to say anything they want to in response to what they've heard from the other speakers. And then we're going to throw it open uh, for questions uh, from the audience uh, with the hope that uh, we'll be able to break at about 7, seven o'clock, which gives us about 15 minutes for each of them to have their say in response to what they've just heard. Um, I'll start with you, Dr. Volkow. You were, you were first. You've, you, you've heard the other two speakers. Uh, what is it you'd like the audience to know uh, that um, you would like to share with them in light of what you've heard from the other speakers? Yeah, and I'll start uh, first on the one on the medicinal marijuana, and it is correct. It is very difficult to get access to marijuana for research purposes. It is correct that the government demands that the marijuana comes from one source, which is um, basically managed by NIDA. This is a, a law. I have nothing to do with it. The DEA has to give you a registration, which is very cumbersome, and it takes a lot of time. 
I basically testified, and I cannot say, because my perspective is just say it is correct, and I know from researchers that this has been very, very difficult, uh, whether you are studying cannabidiol for the treatment of seizure disorders or for analgesia. It is a very slow process. I, I have continuous dialogue with the FDA to try to figure out ways in which we can make this actually much easier, such as the scheduling cannabidiol. There's no evidence that it is rewarding, and there's evidence that it can be beneficial. Uh, you didn't point that out, but methamphetamine, which is one of the most addictive drugs, is a schedule too. So, so there is an inconsistency in some of the process, but, but again, there are regulations that are followed, they have procedures, and that's what happens. With respect to the issue of the legalization, I'm very sensitive to the notion of criminalizing substance abusers. And one of the reasons that I took this job is because I wanted to change the perspective of looking at an addicted person as a criminal and sending them to jail and addressing that it is a health condition that we need to address. And yet uh, there are, so I am pro decriminalization of marijuana. What I'm against is the legalization for marijuana that creates an industry who is going to be making profit by making people smoke marijuana. The extent to which there are going to be opportunities for doing marijuana for medical purposes is something that needs to be evaluated. We favor the extraction of the active ingredients where you can control and they're assessing their value. But be it as it may, we do science in order to get data that informs us. I love the concept of being able to regulate it in a way that we protect us. But we know that uh, alcohol has, is illegal to for teenagers and yet the number one cause of death in the United States for young people is alcohol because of accidents. So we can say theoretically we're going to regulate it, but the process of legalization, making drugs so available, is not so simple. I also concede that we advance, like in science and in technology, so we can advance on the way that we can do prevention. But as of now, I not know of any single program that has been able to really protect uh, teenagers of the adverse effects of drugs. And I just want to end up by saying the number one cause of preventable death in the world is tobacco. The number three cause of preventable death in the world is alcohol. Both of them are legal. And my perspective is we need to learn from history. We can, as I say, improve on the way that we've done it in the past, but based on the data that we currently have now, we're doing very, very poorly with the legalized drugs. And there are alternatives. I think that the notion of decriminalization is one that should have happened a long time ago. And again, I'm also very much pro-facilitating uh, research on cannabis and changing some of these um, scheduling of these substances. And I always like the concept of evaluating process. So if someone comes up with a new way, Uruguay has a very interesting way of trying to legalize marijuana that I was curious to see what are the outcomes. We learn from others. And I agree with completely, we cannot go into the West wild and either with a sense of we're going to be successful, not with magical thinking because we haven't been able to protect teenagers from use of legal drugs. Okay, Dr. Bostwick, your turn. <laughs> I think we're probably all in agreement. Um, I, I want to underscore um, mostly my exasperation. Uh, when I went, set out to try to understand this topic, I couldn't find logic. I couldn't find logic in the law. I couldn't find logic in the way the federal government was acting. I couldn't find logic in the way the states were acting. And it was very, very frustrating. Clinically, I'm in the position of having patients come to me to want me to discuss with them what to do about this drug. I also get calls from reporters who want me to talk about prescribing and risks and benefits and dangers. And I have to say to them, I don't know. That's not in my purview. And yet it's happening everywhere. Um, I, I think at the very least we need perhaps to have an ideal structure so that we can work with that structure to make something happen. I want to underscore what Dr. Volkhaus said, that marijuana is unusual in that it doesn't have a Schedule II or a Schedule III um, associate. Heroin on Schedule 1, morphine Schedule 2, oxycodone, et cetera, um, amphetamines, methamphetamine, ADHD drugs, Schedule 2, methamphetamine is Schedule 1, I believe. Am I correct? Amphetamine is Schedule 2. Methamphetamine is, methamphetamine is Schedule 2. 2. 2. Okay. So there are, there are congeners on other uh, or closely related drugs that are on Schedule 2 and Schedule 3. There is not that in that case for, for marijuana. 
Um, I also want to underscore again how challenging it is with botanicals. There are some who would argue that if we'd never made marijuana illegal, it would have simply found its place into herbal medicine. Um, but that's not where we are. And we're still living as if it's 1970, even though there's important research going on uh, to try to understand this. There's stymied research going on. And there's a whole lot of very confusing law happening. It's very odd for me to have a patient sitting in my office who is going from one state to another via my state, wanting to get my opinion on whether the marijuana she is using is hurting her, and not really knowing what to tell her, but more importantly, having her tell me how she's going to hide the marijuana she gets in a legal state in the toilet of her RV so that she can get over the border without getting caught. This is craziness. And then she says, of course, look at me. I'm a little old lady. No one will ever suspect a thing more craziness. And that's, <laughs> so I, I, I think that back to the blurred boundaries idea, it's just a very, it's crazy making to, to, to um, try to, to make sense of this. Again, I was not trying to make a, a political stance one way or the other. I was just expressing, I'm confused. And I've done a lot of effort to try to understand. And the understanding is not there. Thank you. Council Member Grasso, final two minutes and reacting to what you've heard so far. I would just say that I don't think uh, I've spent nearly enough time on the science of it, to be honest. I mean, I think in the long run, uh, that's what needs to happen. So I completely agree that there needs to be a uh, greater understanding of the drugs that we have available to us, but not just because it's good for science and good to know what the future is for people, uh, but because people are using them now. And the reality on the ground is that there's uh, more and more people using drugs that are illegal too. Uh, and perhaps if we could educate the public more uh, through campaigns that have worked in the past, like with smoking campaigns, we could uh, decrease the use of these drugs even more. Um, and that, you know, I think I, agreed, I agree wholeheartedly that we shouldn't glorify these drugs and that we shouldn't say that they're they're great for you if we don't know that they're great for you or not great for you. And, but yet, I, I think it always goes back for me to um, the question of who the laws really impact. And as a lawmaker, I, you know, I have an obligation to, to look very closely at that. And, and it was put very blatantly in my face that the reality of the prohibition of marijuana in the District of Columbia was disproportionately impacting um, African Americans and poor people in the city. So. Um, I think that's a real challenge for our government and a real challenge for the future of this country. Um, also, you know, as we move forward with medical marijuana and we move forward with uh, recreational use, um, we're running into continual problems. I think your points are, are really well put, is that it's just a hodgepodge that we're throwing together because we're playing a reaction game. Until we actually put a real regulatory framework in place, we're going to keep playing this. Um, so, you know, in the past, illegal marijuana was used equally between wealthy communities and poor communities. But we know that 91% of the arrests were done in poor communities. Why was that? That was because the wealthier communities have backyards and decks, uh, and poor communities have common space where they gather um, when it's hot in the building. And so there was an easier access for the police. We also know that there's an unconscious bias, racial bias that happens in law enforcement. Um, so you put all that together and you say to yourself, how do we undo that in a responsible way? Well, we're trying to do that now. Um, I supported uh, Initiative 71 because I felt like it was a good kick in the teeth to the world here in DC and uh, to the federal government. Now we have to deal with that. And we are slowly but surely dealing with it. The big question of private clubs has come up. Um, the fact of the matter is right now, you can possess up to two ounces of marijuana in the District of Columbia legally. You cannot buy it. You cannot sell it. Uh, so the people that are still getting arrested are the ones that are selling it in the underground market in neighborhoods where they don't have big fancy backyards to sell it without getting caught. So you know this fundamental problem that we had to start with still exists and is something that I think we need to continue to tackle and that's why I think a strict regulatory framework is important. Well, thank you. I want to encourage, well, <laughs> I guess I don't have to encourage people to, to, to come to the microphone. I just asked your name, affiliation, and if you're directing it to everybody or a person in particular, let, let's know that at the beginning so they can be thinking about it. Yes, please, sir. Uh, Richard Kennedy from Virginia is primarily for Dr. Volkow. Uh, I'm an economist who has never 
tried marijuana, but I got interested in the issue when I was in grad school, which was several years before NIDA was created. Uh, I thought the case for fully legalizing it was very clear then because of the research that had been done up to that point, of which there was actually quite a bit. Uh, and I look at, well, that was before going on to a, a career as, as a CA analyst, uh, which was an interesting place to work because we're just told to seek the truth and regardless of what US policy is. I look at NIDA's chart of commonly abused drugs, a uh, very good chart, lots of information. I think it makes clear to a rational person that marijuana is a much safer drug than alcohol or tobacco. And the government policy then should not be to prohibit it, but to encourage people to use the less dangerous drug. So I'd like your comments on that. Yeah, no, and that's a very important question, and it's an issue that a lot of people bring up, and I basically say, I don't think it's, it's a good strategy to say which drug is more harmful than the other, uh, because the, the effects are different. For example, nicotine will kill you when you are over 60, 65 years of age or 70 years of age, uh, but marijuana very likely will impair your cognitive capacity as an adolescent. So if you look at it from that perspective, it says, well, it, what is more harmful? So, and also the other aspect are around it that relates to the fact that your particular sensitivity to a drug varies as a function of your background. So in someone, marijuana, or they can smoke until they are 100 years of age and there's never cancer, and in some there is, and the same thing with marijuana. So in my view, marijuana is of concern to me particularly for two things. One of them, because of its effects on brain development, which actually jeopardize the opportunity that an individual we have because our cognitive capacity is fundamental for success, number one. And the other one that I didn't speak about is that uh, cannabis is a regulatory modulator of many systems, the endogenous cannabinoid system. And one of the areas that has been identified with a chronic use of marijuana is that decreasing motivation and drive. And so people put a lot of attention in terms of your cognitive ability, but as important is your drive and your energy to achieve something. So if you have a drug that drives that out of you, that's going to put you again at a tremendous disadvantage. So that's why I don't like this issue of which one is worse than the other. Uh, it depends on multiple factors. And I would say that consuming drugs by itself um, is a roulette. I mean, we all drink a glass of wine, no big deal. No if you have the genetics, you can become an alcoholic, and it's devastating. So it is, um, that's, that's the argument I would put. I cannot say that marijuana is less dangerous for a teenager than nicotine. I would say marijuana is much more dangerous for a teenager than nicotine. Nicotine, in fact, can improve cognitive performance and can improve attention. Over here, please. Name, affiliation? Uh, my name is Chandler, and I'm a friend of AAAS. And my question is directed primarily at Dr. Volkow. However, I would um, imagine that the other physician and me, even perhaps the attorney, would, might have something <clears throat> to comment on. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm a curious person. That's why I hang out here sometimes. And um, your graphs were peculiar to me. <clears throat> I'm kind of nervous. And um, because, as a curious person, I visited a girlfriend, um, I've known her for 45 years, um, in Colorado. And in Colorado, they have these edibles. And these edibles look like candies, like jelly, non perials they look like raspberries and blackberries. I don't know where you go shopping, but each one of these candies was 10 milligrams, which was interesting to me because of a sudden, it's no longer a yes or no question. It was a quantifiable answer, a qualifiable answer. It used to be somebody would, <coughs> there's so many things that are so subjective. In, in America, North America, <laughs> uh, if you go to a party and they're, they're, they're passing a joint around, it's likely to be about the size of my little finger, but if you go to Jamaica, it's this big. And in America, it's shared as far as it'll go. But in Jamaica, it's all their own. <laughs> they don't share. So your graphs were showing things like daily smoking. But it didn't say a one hit. It didn't say until you're stoned. It didn't say a whole cigarette. There was absolutely nothing 
that I could gauge. And I would imagine that if you did quantify and qualify the smoking, that those graphs would look so different because everybody um, is different. And so to say that they smoke today, eh, you know, is it, was it a polite hit? Or was it a, you know, they enjoyed a half a joint with their spouse? Or I don't know, however it goes. Or however it goes. <laughs> OK, Let, let's yeah. give her a chance to answer uh, no, that. No, that's a very good question. And actually, um, you are a curious person, and you have a scientific brain. Because in, rea in, in truth, the, the ability to quantify the exposure of uh, drugs other than alcohol in general, and perhaps a little bit nicotine is very, very difficult. So when we are saying how does cocaine or methamphetamine affects you, we basically, there is an uncertainty. And this is actually even worse with marijuana because in, in certain drugs like cocaine, I can measure the content of cocaine and get a more or less an idea. Marijuana is much harder to quantify. So this is within the error margins of all of these measurements when you're trying to establish how much of a drug a person consumes. It is recognized that when individuals are smoking regularly, it tends to be that they smoke uh, one, two, or three joints a day, but we don't know precisely. We don't know if they consume the whole joint or they just consume half of them. If they are taking edibles, we don't know if they eat the whole cookie or just a little fragment that they are aiming to do. So that there is an imprecision, uh, but it's not unique just to marijuana. As I say, it's basically something that we in the field have to struggle to try to get better quantification. And, and, and uh, in fact, it's something that we are investing resources for researchers to come, ways, to come up with ways that we can objectively measure the levels of exposure. But as of now, nobody has been successful. Dr. Boswick, did you want to add um, to that? Yes, I do. One of the challenges uh, to the whole way in which we prescribe medications in this country is that when a person smokes a marijuana joint, they decide how much they want. The doctor typically will prescribe uh, an amount, um, but, the, but the person gets what they get, and they use as much as they want to use, which really flies in the face of the way we typically do it. The only analogy I can think of is a pump that's used for um, opiates in the hospital, where, but the doctor does have control of the lockout, and it's shown that patients who use those pumps actually use less drug than they would if they were given pills. Um, so the question that I would have, I, I appreciate the point that, the, that the, uh, the, the marijuana is becoming more and more potent, but I don't know that even translates into people using less of it to get the same effect that they got with more of it. So there's this other issue of of the person deciding how much they want to use rather than just taking it. One of the major issues with nabilone, that's Marinol, is that it's unpredictable what the effect is going to be. You get the pill, it goes to the gut, it goes to the liver, and you don't know what you're going to get, and you don't know when you're going to get it for an effect. Uh, whereas when you smoke, uh, you get an immediate effect, and depending on how quickly or slowly you smoke, you can titrate it to an effect. And that really is another way in which this just doesn't fit with the way that we typically prescribe drugs. The, um, uh, we're obviously not going to get to all of these questions if we take them one by one and still uh, have our break. Uh, I, I'm willing to go another five minutes. Uh, if we could ask, uh, we'll go back and forth, ask you to say who you are, affiliation, and your quick question, then the next one, and then the next one, and panel, Think about all of them, which ones you want to answer, so forth and so on. So I think we start here, and then we'll go there, et cetera. Please. Jessica Windham, AAAS, and my question is for Dr. Volkow. What do we know about the impacts of secondhand marijuana smoking? OK, over here, please. Yes, Christine Miller, Smart Approaches to Marijuana in Maryland. And my question is for David Grosso. Are you aware, you spoke of you know, caring about uh, the fact that legalization would enable you to control what gets to kids. Actually, Colorado now leads the nation in past month use by 12 to 17 year olds. And DC is up there along with Oregon and Washington. They're all in the top five. But my question for you is, what are you doing to educate? If you care about educating, why haven't you started that process now? Okay, over here, please. Uh, Lee Hopcraft with Dollar High Club in DC. Uh, I wanted to ask, I want to kind of refer back to a Forbes article and the way that the cannabis industry has been seen nationally. Uh, Forbes called it the best starting industry in the country uh, with over seven billion in uh, proposed revenue for the next few years. Um, how do you guys feel that that's going to affect the way that science is 
looking at cannabis, uh, the amount of money that's being poured into it around the country. Over here, please. Uh, Dr. John Van Meter, Georgetown University. Um, I'm appreciative about the fact that de decriminalization is important and it's, uh, criminalization has been misused. I think one of the factors that hasn't been enunciated with regards to decriminalization is that it gives the perception, and Dr. Volkow's graphs, one of her early graphs showed this, it gives the perception that somehow marijuana is not a dangerous substance. And so while smoking and alcohol use in, in adolescents is going down, her graphs are showing, the data is showing that marijuana use is going up because the message is not getting out there to the adolescents, to the teenagers, that just because it's become decriminalized or legalized or what have you, that it still doesn't mean it's safe. Okay, over here, please. It, um, I'm Alex, uh, I guess unaffiliated. Um, this is uh, for anyone who knows the answer. Um, basically, just wondering, I, uh, Dr. Volko, I, I saw the thing about the genes being a very important factor in um, uh, schizophrenia potentially being um, activated by marijuana. And I'm just wondering, is there like, is there a way to test for genetics, I guess? Is there a way to test to see um, if you would be at risk for, if you smoke marijuana to activate some mental health issue? Thanks. Over here, please. Uh, Levin Bokaria, Georgetown University. Uh, this is a question primarily for Dr. Volkov. Um, I'm not sure if we'll have time, but if you could go over uh, about the uh, question of whether marijuana is a gateway drug or not, and what the current research is on that topic. And last one here, and then the last one there. Please. My name is Andrew, also a friend of AAAS. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Volko. Um, are there factors that make a person more or less uh, likely to become addicted to marijuana? And can you discuss those factors? And also, any factors that make someone more or less likely to be affected by uh, the effects of marijuana? And the last question, please. Thanks. Um, so my question is about policymaking. Uh, what I would like to know is, what is it about the history of marijuana, its enforcement and its relationship with the law and society has made it uh, treated in the way that it is being treated? And how come other drugs that are popularly consumed, such as sugar and caffeine, are not being addressed in the same way as other drugs of abuse that Nixon and assorted colleagues uh, called out in the 1970s? Okay, I'm just gonna make a chairman's prerogative and ask uh, Dr. Bostwick if he wants to answer any of those questions, then we'll go to the council member, and then Dr. Volko, you got the bulk of them, I'll let, let you go last. <laughs> Dr. Bostwick, <laughs> any of them. I, the only thing I would again point out, um, for better or for worse, we do have a paradigm for understanding the drugs that we take in place in the country, that's through the FDA, um, and I, my, observation would be that in the case of marijuana, we simply have not been able to use that paradigm to the fullest to understand the risks and benefits of, the, of this substance. Please, um, I think the question to me was about educating our youth, which I think is extremely important. I think there's a difference between trying to scare our youth into not doing something and actually educating them. And I think helping them make the best choices that they can make to not do drugs. And uh, when I was growing up, I'm 46 years old, when I was growing up it was Nancy Reagan's Just Say No, um, and the war on drugs was really raging. So I, I can tell you that didn't work. Um, and <laughs> so I'm feeling like since that didn't work, we need to find a better way to do it. And I think it is through education. And I do agree with you, and in the bill that I introduced, a large portion of the money would go towards that specific purpose which would be to make sure that our youth are uh, not in the position where they ever will do marijuana and encouraging them to not do it. Dr. Volkow, you are both your memory and uh, your ability to memory. answer questions are tested now. Please, go ahead. The first question was related to secondhand smoke and there's very little data on whether, to what extent uh, you can inhale sufficient uh, 9-THC in order to have psychoactive effects. But this, as, as, so I cannot comment. I wish I had more information. Then there was the question of the gateway drug of marijuana. 
The epidemiological data does show that it's uh, the, one of the first drugs to be initiated, but those studies are confounded by the fact that if you have the personality of uh, being curious and trying to test drugs, it's much more likely that you get exposed to cannabis first than methamphetamine. So there is a social component that may explain the epidemiological data. From animal experiments, if you expose animals to cannabis very early on, then you actually enhance the rewarding effects of other drugs. So there is both biological data, but epidemiologically it is confounded by multiple factors. With respect to the question of schizophrenia and do we know, are there certain genes that we can test right now that can tell you who is at risk for schizophrenia? And the answer is no. Unfortunately, for none of the mental diseases, including addiction, do we have now genes that can explain and, and tell you if you have this gene, you shouldn't do it. But what we do know, which is actually much more predictable and has a larger effect size, if you have a family history of psychosis, or if you have had a short psychotic episode in, in the past, that puts you at much greater risk of having an adverse psychotic episode with cannabis. And in fact, the data has shown that it seems like you sensitize. <coughs> so my, my advice would be someone coming from a family, um, a history of family where there is mental illness, I would stay away from cannabis. In the future, we'll have genes that will tell you this or that vulnerability. But what we're also learning about genes is that the way that genes actually influence the outcomes of these diseases is by influencing the way that you respond to the environment. So if you have a, a gene, that doesn't mean you are predestined to go there. But if you have that gene and you are in an environment that promotes that negative outcome, you will, as opposed to not having it, whether if you get exposed to that adverse effect, you will not de um, develop the bad condition. And that, and that argument, that narrative, is exactly the same thing in terms of vulnerability for addiction as it relates to genes. However, we don't know for as vulnerability for any drug, whether it's cannabis, alcohol, nicotine, any one of them. The younger the start, you start, the greater the risk that you would become addicted. The other, the other factor that determines, so of course, family history of addiction. So if you have a family history of addiction, do not go there because that means you probably are at high risk. I have a family history of alcoholism, so I'm very, very sensitive about it. And the third one is mental illness. Individuals with mental illness are the ones that are most vulnerable for uh, the consumption of substance use. And so while we've made tremendous strides in decreasing smoking in our country, 50% of those cigarettes are smoked by the mentally ill, who are dying at least 10 years earlier because of the use of smoking. And we also can, can predict that the mentally ill will be the more vulnerable if there is a third legalized drug. So if you are very young, you are at higher risk. If you have a, a history of a mental disorder or substance use disorder, you are at higher risk. And if you do have a mental illness, you are at higher risk. And, and, and in, the, in the future, there will be, uh, I'm sure, they will start to emerge genetic testing. But again, I highlight it's genes with environment. Genes by themselves is not the whole story. I'm sure I forgot some of the other questions, guys, but I apologize. But that's why we have a reception. So would you please join me in thanking our panel?